and family and friends. We are so happy for us to be gathered in this place virtually once again and to be celebrating so much this week. We're celebrating the gift of fathering, of fathers, of uncles, of brothers, of brother friends, of what it means to have, to have and to be blessed to have, um, to have and to be blessed uh, to have journeyed with uh, those who have functioned as uh, in the fathering capacity uh, in our lives in different ways, uh, as well as celebrating what it means for Juneteenth to be recognized and how long fought uh, that has been and what that means to begin to, as a historian in our midst, to begin to uh, do some history work, um, corrective history work uh, in our country. And so we celebrate much and we remember much today in this space. And we hope that you find it to be one that is rich wherever you are and whatever you may, may be at this moment, a moment of remembering, a moment of celebrating, a moment of thinking about what is, what is next before us. Hear this opening prayer, spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us wherever we may be and whatever we may be doing. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Give us peace, give us hope, give us joy, give us memories that ignite us and animate us for the work that is ahead. We thank you for the gifts of parenting, of fathering, of mothering, of journeying with each other, of care tending and being present. We thank you for the spirits of courage. We thank you for the spirits of hope. We thank you for the love that is yet in our midst, for we know, God, that you are love. We thank you for the ways that we have been loved and the ways that we are yet called to love. Strengthen us in our living today. It is in the precious name of Jesus that we welcome your spirit. Amen and amen. Lift every voice and sing. Let us march on until victory is won. What a wonderful way to begin our morning, reminding ourselves of the songs that our communities 
uh, continue to sing, that we must continue to sing and that there is work yet for us to continue doing. Our sermon reading today picks up on this theme of being a people who sings our songs of hope and joy and journey and history in his meditation called, I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. Hear these words from Thurman as you center into your spaces today. The old song of my spirit, spirit has wearied itself out. It has long ago been learned by heart so that now it repeats itself over and over, bringing no added joy to my days or lift to my spirit. It is a good song measured to a rhythm to which I am bound by ties of habit and timidity of mind. The words belong to old experiences, which once sprang fresh as water from a mountain crevice fed by melting snows. But my life has passed beyond to other levels where the old song is meaningless. I demand of the old song that it meet the need of present urgencies. Also, I know that the work of the old song, perfect in its place, is not for the new demand. I, I will sing a new song. As difficult as it is, I must learn the new song that is capable of meeting the new need. I must fashion new words born of all the new growth of my life, my mind and my spirit. I will sing a new song. I must prepare for new melodies that have never been mine before, that all that is within me may lift my voice unto God and spirit. How I love the old familiarity of the wearied melody, how I shrink from the harsh discords of the new untried harmonies. But I, I will sing a new song. Teach me my God, my father, my mother, O oh spirit, that I might learn with the abandonment and enthusiasm of Jesus, the fresh new accent, the untried melody, to meet the need of the untried tomorrow. Thus, I may rejoice with each new day and delight my spirit in each fresh unfolding. I, I will sing a new song. I, I will sing this day a new song unto thee, O God. Teach me, O God, that I might learn this new song. Amen and Ashe. We are in a season of learning new songs. And I hope that we continue to do that work together as a community, as the world begins to transition back and things begin to open and things begin to change. We have a new holiday added in our midst and we are, yes, remembering the old songs, but we also meet, not, must be discerning what are the new songs, the new work, the ongoing work that we are to continue as we go, what Thurman said, into our tomorrow. I hope that we find encouragement in, um, in that. Related to the tomorrow, permit me to have a bit of a digression and to invite you to join us um, in, um, for um, three weeks of listening to Thurman starting um, Wednesday, June 30th. Uh, at noonday. We will spend three weeks at noonday on Wednesday, June 30th, July 7th, and July 14th engaged in our own kind of virtual Howard Thurman listening. And no, I won't be reading. <laughs> you will be hearing Thurman's voice. So we will be listening to a bit of Thurman's own lectures on really his sermons, uh, and then spending some time in that noonday hour unpacking what we hear. It's one thing to read Thurman and to hear Thurman read. It's a whole other experience to hear Thurman for yourself as you begin to encounter that religious experience, that spiritual moment as he is doing the work out loud and inviting us to journey with him. So I hope that you will join us in our Thurman virtual listening on June 30th, July 7th, and July 14th. 
We want to, um, Marty, are you with me? I am indeed. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, happy Father's Day to, to Brother B. <laughs> Amen. He's somewhere getting ready to be celebrated. <laughs> yes. In a unique way. Um, that, that meditation was so beautiful. That reading was so yeah. beautiful. Um, and so now for all of those, good morning, happy Father's Day, we invite you in the chat space as we take a moment to hear this beautiful song that simply says, thanks for staying. We invite you in the chat space to share your memories of your fathers, grandfathers, brothers, uncles, men, friends in your life that have stood in the gap. But we also invite you to celebrate those moments of family mm -hmm. as we take this time to celebrate a big weekend in the life of our community. So mm -hmm. we're gonna turn our cameras off and we're gonna ask you to turn your ears up a little more and allow your mind to journey back to the days and to the memories of having strong men in your life. Again, this is Thanks for Staying. Please use the chat space to share and to celebrate on this beautiful Father's Day, amen. It seems so amazing But falling stars don't shine They have no place in the sky We forget about the ones still hanging Falling is easy Standing takes strength You
Our fathers have been warrior kings, leaders of nations and pillars of faith and church and society. Strengthen their minds, bodies, and spirits so that they may faithfully serve you. Help today's fathers, O oh God, to become wiser managers of their households. Black fathers have distinguished themselves in every profession at home and abroad. They have taught us strength and adversity and have led us in work and at play, in sports, in fishing, in building and trades. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to you till death. Amen and happy Father's Day. Reverend Shively. Hello, Marty. So good. Thank you so much for um, that reading. Uh, I just wanted to invite you. I know I think you put it in the chat, but um, who are you remembering and celebrating today? Ooh, it's such a long list. And some days I get a little, little full because so many have gone on to be with the Lord, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, but I always celebrate my grandfathers. Well, of course, I have to start by celebrating my father, who's yeah. not too far from me right now. Yeah. Um, but celebrating my father because he ensured that we knew um, and had a relationship with our grandfathers and our great uncles and, um, and great, great cousins and that we understood who we came from and why I never got to meet my father's mother because he transitioned when my mother was only 16. So we never got to meet him. Um, every time I see a picture of him, I see myself in so many ways. And so I know that um, he is here. So um, for Henry Olimar Sr. and for Arthur Austin and so many, um, so many, um, I'm just grateful and thankful that I have the memory to celebrate. What about you? I'm thankful for absolutely my father and my dad's and um, just so thankful for that. I'm, I tell you, I'm really struck today by um, the work of my uncles and um, how they've been um, um, strong forces, um, oak trees for me in, in moments that were really um, difficult. So there's a way in which for me, the fathering piece is very intentional. I've been fathered by uncles and I would actually say fathered by brother friends. I mean, so, you know, um, some of my brother friends, especially now in the field and the work that we do, you know, they are, they are the oak trees standing, uh, standing by. And I find myself think so thankful for them and the ways in which even as brother friends, they have been sort of father brother figures that um, stand strong and tall so that, uh, and you know, keep some of the noise away <laughs> so that I can do the work that I need to do. And so I take all of that seriously right now. I'm just so thankful for the that. fullness. Yeah, I love how you said that keep all the noise away. And, and I think that is um, the, the responsibility of a, of a strong man in general, just to yeah. help keep the noise away. And um, as I have been taught, and I say it all the time, to never stop dreaming and never stop believing. Yeah, um, never stop. So, so and, absolutely. and look, and then I would be remiss if I don't say I'm appreciative of that father up there who uh, is, say, right. is fathering these girls, and then as, as well as me, making sure we get where we need to go. <laughs> absolutely. I will know he has gray hair and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I love that people are still that all those watching are still sharing in the chat space. Keep doing that. I'm sure it'll be it'll continue into the worship experience this morning. Well, so Metropolitan, you very much. And well, Metropolitan, I hope that you we hope you continue to celebrate and to remember and to name those people uh, who have journeyed with you, and that you continue to celebrate the Juneteenth season. And even as we continue to know there is yet work ahead, we are getting ready to go to the pastoral reflections, and then the next voice you will hear will be our very own pastor, William Lamar the Fourth. And we are so thankful for his work and his voice and the voice of our community as it continues to go forward. So remember, Metropolitan family, we are thankful for you and we love you. Absolutely. Greetings, Metropolitan family and friends. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, grandfathers, and father figures. This week, we also remember the nine members of Mother Emanuel AME Church who were killed on June 17th in 2015, 
On that night, clergy and members of Emmanuel AME were mercilessly gunned down during a Bible study by a 21-year-old white supremacist. Let us say each of the names of the fallen. Reverend Clementa Pinckney, Cynthia Hurd, Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Tawanza Sanders, Ethel Lance, Susie Jackson, Reverend D. Payne Middleton Doctor, Reverend Daniel Simmons, Myra Thompson. May their souls continue to rise. Please join us Monday through Friday from 7 to 7.15 a.m. for Meditations with Metropolitan. To sign up to offer a meditation or to share your prayer request, email the Morning Meditations team at prayer.metro1518 at gmail.com. Just a reminder, both Noonday and Pastor Study on Wednesdays are on hiatus during the months of June, July, and August. We do invite you, however, to join us June 30th, July 7th, and July 14th at noon for a listening series this summer on Howard Washington Thurman. Reverend Dr. Shively Smith will guide us through discussions on lectures, prayers, meditations, and writings by Dr. Thurman after we listen to them together. The login information is the same as the Wednesday Noonday Bible study, and we'll share that link in the newsletter. Join us on Saturdays at 11 a.m. on Facebook for Cafe Met. We're excited to share wonderful news from Sarah and Albert Coons. Their latest edition has arrived. Welcome, Samira Coons. Samira was born last week weighing seven pounds and five ounces. Mother, father, and little brother and Samira are all doing well. Congratulations, Sarah and Albert. The Potomac District Youth Explosion will be held Friday, June 25th at 7 p.m. and Saturday, June 26th at 12 p.m. For more information, visit the newsletter in the coming weeks. The Youth and Family Ministry invites you to an intergenerational virtual talent show on Monday, June 28th at 6.30. We're looking for talent from all ages. Anyone with the gift of poetry, dance, mime, or song is free to sign up. To sign up, please send an email to youthministry at metropolitanamec.org. Metropolitan will host its virtual vacation Bible school the week of July 26th through the 30th, 2021 from 7 to 8 each night. Save the date. The men's prayer call continues this week on Monday from 7.30 to 7.45. The link to register and to join the call is in the newsletter. Your giving is a wonderful expression of God's generosity. As you know, there are three ways to give via check mail to Metropolitan, via credit card on the website, and via text or cash app. To text to give, text Metro 1518 to 73256. Our cash app handle is dollar sign Metropolitan AME. Please pray for those experiencing grief and for the health, strength, and healing of all of those in need. This week we lift Brother Eddie Smoot and family in the passing of his mother, Marjorie Smoot. We lift the family of Barbara Pope Bennett, Reverend John Petty in the passing of his cousin, Sister Tanya Craig and the family of Sister Craig on the loss of her brother Clyde Ricky Tice and Sister Estella Speaks on the loss of her sister-in-law, Judy Morris. We also ask for continued prayers for our faithful members, Ambassador Shirley Barnes, Brother Lloyd Fennell, Dr. Wilma Harvey, Brother Garland Dixon, Deaconess Beverly Lee, Sister Rosemarie Elliott, Sister Janice Faraby, Brother Lacey Flagg, Dr. Mercedes Dixon, Reverend Aisha Karima, Sister Ruby Joyce, Dr. Charles Curry, Deaconess Mary Burroughs, Deaconess Jeanette Spicer, and Mother Ethel Delaney Lee. Your faithfulness continues to be a testament to our joy and to our resilience in these challenging times. We hope you'll stay connected with us. Mondays for the men's prayer call, daily for morning meditation, Wednesdays for study when we have it, Saturdays for Cafe Met, and Sundays for worship. We also invite you to continue to participate virtually in all of the ministries and their activities at Metropolitan. Grace and peace to each of you. Good morning to all, and we welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, also Father's Day, as we celebrate, as we worship, and liberate together. I'm thankful to our meditations team, thankful to Brother Marty, Dr. Shively, 
so many others who set the context for our worship. We are clear that we worship because God calls us. God calls us into relationship with God's self, and we are thankful. Now, before we move forward in worship, I want to invite us into a divine and ancestral moment. I'm going to ask you to place in the chat the names of your fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, who are now in the cloud of witnesses and among the ancestors. Let's take a moment now, and I'd ask you to place those names, fathers, grandfathers, brothers, friends, father figures, those who are ancestors, place their names in the chat. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith. Continue to place these names in chat because we live in a nation that would cause us to forget. Our strength is in remembering. The table before us in the church where we worship says this do in remembrance of me without remembering the one who was sent, without remembering those who were sent to us, for us, we will lose our way and our very lives. In a nation that degrades black men, we celebrate them, we lift us up in all of our beauty, in all of our brokenness, in all of our strength and imperfections. We lift up these men, continue to place their names in chat, Continue to call their names to your children and their children. And knowing the African sense, we are not dead until we are no longer remembered. So let us keep them alive by remembering them, by calling their names. Let us pray. Pour out upon us, O oh God, the power and wisdom of your spirit, that we may walk with Christ the way of the cross, the Via Dolorosa, ready to offer even the gift of our lives to show forth to the world our hope in your kingdom. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our doxology.
joining me on the platform is one of the best fathers I know, Brother Carlos Botts. Good morning, Pastor and Father Good morning. Hager. Happy Father's Day to you, sir. He's not only a father to wonderful sons and wonderful grandfather, he's a father to a cat. And uh, he also uh, is a great cook. So I'm telling all your business, but Carlos. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining me. And I hope you uh, enjoy your day today, sir. You deserve it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we look around and see how we have been blessed. Blessed with community, with beauty, with friendship, with faith. God's goodness washes over us, and we receive these gifts with thanks. In this time, we thank God for all that we have been given. So on this beautiful day, let us worship the God of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carlos. Now our opening hymn. We want to share with you all, uh, just to remind you that when that performance occurred, when that worship occurred, Metropolitan had been invited to the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. And Brother Marty and our team did an extraordinary job representing us. And we're thankful for that ministry and how it lifts our souls and prepares us for the work that we are called to do. 
Welcome to each and every one of you on this morning. We especially welcome those of you who are virtual guests of Metropolitan. We want to remind you all of the growth that we are experiencing, and it is because you all are inviting friends, families, and the Christian thing to do would be to invite enemies as well. And so we are thankful that you are with us today. You could have done a lot of things on this morning, and you chose to engage with us, and we're thankful. If you are looking for prayer, we do pray together after worship. And we uh, meditate every day, Monday through Friday. If you're looking for a church home, I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your community of faith. Here on this slide, you see metropolitaname.org forward slash join. If you go to that uh, link, place your name and information in, our ministers will be in touch with you and we will bring you forth and forward. Very, very thankful. Uh, let me mention, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll save that, getting ahead of myself. Uh, we are, again, excited to share news from the Coons family, Dr. Albert and Sister Sarah. Their new daughter has arrived, Samira Coons, and all are well. Congratulations to you, Dr. Coons, and to Sister Sarah, and to little brother, young Albert IV. Join us this week for morning meditations, Monday through Friday, uh, 7 a.m. to 7.15. Join us also for Cafe Metropolitan on Saturdays at 11. We're thankful to the faithful teams that make morning meditation Cafe Met possible. I wanna make sure many of us don't think about all of the work that goes into planning and recruiting and the logistics of making these things happen. Some of the texts, would you just text, thank you to the morning meditations team, thankful to Brother Marty, let them know that we appreciate the work that they're doing in ministry to keep us together and strong during these days. Join us on June 30th, July 7th, and July 14th at noon for a summer listening series on Howard Washington Thurman. Reverend Dr. Smith will guide us through discussions and lectures. And Dr. Smith uh, has been a part of a volume recently from scholars and practitioners about the work, the life and ministry of Dr. Thurman. And so she knows that of which she speaks. And you see that every Sunday morning as she leads us and guides us. And let me again share with you all the reason we go through this is because we think it's important to hear our ancestral voices calling us back to holy and mystical and mysterious places. And so we thank you. The Youth and Family Ministry invites you to our intergenerational virtual talent show on Monday, June 28th at 6.30 p.m. We're looking for local talent of all ages and you can sing, you can do poetry, you can dance, mime, whatever it is that you're gifted to do. You can sign to sign up, send an email, and the email be uh, addresses in the in the chat. Youth Ministry at MetropolitanAMEC.org. I want to celebrate the ministry of Sister Robbie Be Beatty, who for many years was the president of the Kelly Lay Organization. Sister Robbie, thank you for your faithful leadership of the Kelly Lay Organization. And let me lift up and congratulate our new leaders of the great Kelly Lay Organization, Sister Maria Wallace as president, Janice Murray as vice president, Phyllis Camper as recording secretary. Thank you all for your ministries. The prayer call for men continues this week, Monday morning, 7.30 a.m. to 7.45 the Potomac District Youth Gathering, June 25th through the 26th. We wanna celebrate that our own uh, sister Taria is uh, the district church school superintendent. I wanna thank her for her work. Vacation Bible School, July 26th through 30th, seven to 8 p.m. Please join us, links are in the chat. If you use a CPAP machine, we wanna encourage you to check with your physician to ensure that the machine has not been recalled. We've been getting information, we wanna get that out. Please pray for those experiencing grief. We lift up Brother Eddie Smoot, with whom I spoke this week, who will be traveling to South Carolina to funeralize his mother. And uh, Colonel Smoot, as you travel, you and your family, we wish you safe travels and know that we are here for you and with you. We're praying today for the family of Sister Barbara Pope Bennett, who was a teacher of French, uh, who was a lover of beautiful music, who was a great mother and wife to her husband who transitioned not long ago, a great member also of the sons and daughters of Allen Ministry. Her services will be today at 11 o'clock a.m. and our own Reverend Moya is with the family. 
is a presence on behalf of Metropolitan. And so we pray for Sister Bianca and Brother Brad, her children, that God will be with you as your mother transitions and that we will be the community we're called to be. We pray for Reverend John Petty and the passing of his cousin and Sister Tanya Craig and family, the loss of her brother Clyde Tice and mother Estella Speaks with the passing of her sister-in-law Judy uh, Morris and Dr. Julianne Malvo, with whom I spoke uh, also, whose mother transitioned in California. We're praying for you. We also celebrate with Dr. Malvo as she has been appointed uh, over at the College of Ethnic Studies at one of the universities uh, out there in California. More information is forthcoming. Pray for those who are in need of healing. We encourage you to leave the names of people in need of prayer in our chat. And on today, we also want to acknowledge those who were massacred in their house of worship, the Emmanuel Nine. I wanna take just a few moments of stillness. And I wanna remind us that the scourge of violence that began the American Imperial Project has not ended. Let us not believe for one moment that it has. I want to lift up the name of Reverend Clemente Pinckney, whom I knew personally, sat in his office, laughed and smiled with him. Cynthia Hurd, Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Brother Taiwanza Sanders, a young college graduate, Allen University, Mother Ethel Lance, Susie Jackson, Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor, Reverend Daniel Super Simmons from the 7th Episcopal District, one whom I knew, I shook his hand, laughed with him, smiled with him, and Myra Thompson. May they rest in God's perpetual light. May we never, ever forget. Now our stewardship moment in time of prayer from the Honorable Judge Clayton Harris, one of our trustees. Good morning, Reverend Lamar, ministerial staff, fellow officers and members of this great church. The scripture today comes from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Today, I bring you the stewardship moment for Father's Day. Father's Day for me has always been one of mixed emotions. I was never fully close to my own father, but I had many father figures in my life. But once I became a father on my own to three wonderful accomplished young men, I began to understand exactly what fatherhood and what being a father meant. As they grew into manhood, my pride and that of my wife ran over and over. We watched and worried and sometimes cried and rejoicing at their accomplishments. And we are indeed very grateful and proud of all of our three sons. This year, Father's Day comes at an especially poignant moment for me. You see, today is also the 78th anniversary of my mother's birth. Today, unlike so many before, I will not get to call her and wish her a happy day and hear her joke with me about whose day this really is. Nevertheless, I rejoice in the many years that I shared with her for you see, she was a shining example in her life of stewardship. She left a legacy of giving back to the many people she touched. That is what stewardship is all about, giving back in gratefulness for all that God has provided to us and continues to do so, despite our failures often to live up to God's commands. It's about sacrifice, giving back some of our resources to the greater good for all. And finally, I wish to say to all the fathers and father figures, happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Aarons, for your continued service. And also congratulations and happy, happy retirement to your lovely wife, Sister Linda, who serves as an educator still, even though she doesn't have to report to school like she used to. And so we ask you to send your checks to Metropolitan AME Church, 1518 M Street Northwest in the capital city, 20005. If you are part of our ACS platform, 
you may give there or via PayPal, metropolitaname.org forward slash give uh, via your mobile device. You may give at cash app dollar sign Metropolitan AME or you may text to give Metro 1518 to 6. I want us to also keep in prayer Sister Ruby McZeer, uh, whose daughter placed on the Facebook platform that we need to lift her up. Sister McZeer is a trailblazer in our community. She and her late husband, Arthur, a part of our community, and uh, they gave a significant gift for scholarships to help uh, young people who are traveling their educational journeys. God be with Jennifer and with Sister Ruby McZeer. And uh, now to read our scripture, one of our very gifted, gifted young sisters, Sister Eden. Eden, how are you? Good, good morning. Good, good morning, thank you, go right ahead. Please turn with me to Mark chapter four, verses 35 to 41. I will be reading from the Message Bible. Mark 4, 35 to 41. Late that day, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink it. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow sleeping. They roused him saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we're going down? Awake now, he told the wind to pipe down and said to the sea, quiet, settle down. The wind ran out of breath. The sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples. Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? They were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this anyway? They asked, wind and sea at his beck and call. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Happy Father's Day to you all. Thank you, Eden, and my best to your family. Very gifted family. Beloved, before we move forward, it is my joy to introduce our preacher for the morning. One of the gifts of serving at Metropolitan is that we get a steady stream of young theologues young persons who have devoted themselves to the study of theology and the practical arts of ministry so that they can serve in some ways the church, uh, whether that is in Christian education or justice ministry or spiritual uh, formation or the pastoral office. And during my tenure, uh, we have really blossomed as a place uh, for folks to see that profession, to see the vocational possibilities. And it's because of the kind of community that Metropolitan has committed itself to becoming. Uh, Gioni Palmer is one of the gifted folks uh, who has come our way. Uh, he and his wife, Ashley, who is a gift in her own right, who works in the political spaces in the city the two sons, uh, Middleton and, uh, where am I going? And, and Caldwell, thank you. Caldwell, forgive me, sir, I'm, I'm getting older. But we're just very, very thankful for the gifts they bring to our community. Gioni is a graduate of UCLA. He is a graduate of the Howard Divinity School where he earned at his graduation uh, honors as a student with the highest grade point average and he earned the Vernon Johns Award in Preaching. Uh, he will shortly be pursuing an MFA at American University. He is in the Board of Examiners. Uh, he has grown to be, for me, a friend and a confidant. He is our minister to men, and I want to thank Brother Barry Sox of the Mighty Men and the Men of Metropolitan for embracing him and his tremendous gifts. He's a writer. Uh, if you pay attention to our Christian recorder, they just published uh, an article that Gioni published about uh, fatherhood in the Christian Recorder, which is the oldest black uh, periodical publication, public, pu published, pardon me, in the United States of America. Uh, Gioni brings great gifts to Metropolitan, to African Methodism, and to our larger community. So after the singing of this next selection, uh, you will hear from our preacher for the day, 
Gioni Pauline. Gioni, in the words of James Weldon Johnson in God's Trombones, may God turpentine your imagination and pin your ear to the listening post. God bless us all as we hear the word proclaimed.
Let us prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits. Heavenly Parent, our Mother and Father, may we always know that the path we walk in life is guided by faith in your faithfulness. Let us always be mindful that despite the many knowns and unknowns of life, we are walking on a path of righteousness and justice, and that we be fortified by an unshakable faith in your grace and mercy that has been handed down through the generations by our ancestors and is wrapped up tight and imbued with the spirit of those ancestors. It can never be taken away from us, and it is something that only we can pass on to the next generation. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. My beloveds, our scripture this morning comes from the New, comes from the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter five, verses seven through nine. The New Revised Standard Version reads, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. A word of God for the people of God. This morning's sermon is entitled, The Gospel, according to Pixar. My beloveds, we go through life knowing that one day we will die. Not only that we will die, but that everyone we know and will ever know will also die. That includes people we don't like, which might make some of y'all feel good. But we also live with the knowledge that everyone we love will at some point experience death. Now, I know that makes none of y'all feel good. It hurts me to know that one day I will not be able to dance with my wife, to sit down for a sumptuous meal prepared by one of my aunties, or laugh with my mom about the time she fell down the stairs in the rain outside my grandmother's house after yelling at me to stop jumping up and down on those stairs or else I would fall, or call one of the men some by blood and others by bond who made me the man I am for advice about how to be the man that I am. Or debate with friends about the greatest hip hop albums by decade or play dominoes with fraternity brothers. My head, heart and soul ache with sorrow knowing that one day all of the rituals I have established with family and friends will one day come to an end at least in the way that I have come to know and experience them. One of the rituals I enjoy most is watching movies with my family. When my oldest son was an infant, he would watch, I would watch movies as he slept in my arms. His mother, grandmother, and I took him to see his first film in a theater when he was just two and a half years old. It was frozen and he hated it. At some point, my youngest son was born our family and our family started a tradition. Friday evenings at the Palmer House are reserved for pizza and a movie. So over the years, I've watched my fair share of family friendly movies, particularly animated films from Pixar. One consistent theme running through many of these movies is that someone who the protagonist is close to will die or has already died but the loss and suffering are central to the plot and propel the main character toward fulfilling their destiny. At the start of Finding Nemo, the title character's mother is killed protecting her eggs from an attacking barracuda. Nemo is the only one to survive to be raised by an overprotective father. Mufasa of the Lion King and Simba's father is trampled in the wildebeest stampede, trying to save his son from the same fate. And in Inside Out, the quote unquote main character suffers a crisis of mental health, losing her connection to family and friends. I say quote unquote because most of the action in the film takes place in her head and is driven by different characters who represent various emotions. 
the loss of a mother and fear of losing his wife and ch children propels sweet young Anakin Skywalker over to the dark side to become Darth Vader. But perhaps the most melancholy and heart-wrenching depictions of suffering are in Up. We are introduced to Carl, a precocious child with boundless spirit of adventure, which is tempered somewhat by reserved demeanor. In his youth, he meets a little girl, Ellie, who will eventually become his wife. From the very beginning, Carl wants nothing more than to be with her and make her happy. Throughout a four minute dialogue less montage, we see them build a life together. And life for Carl and Ellie, like life for all of us, is, by, is beset with many vicissitudes. They experience the joy of purchasing home and the sorrow of a miscarriage. We watch them grow old together. The scene that begins with them standing together at an altar on their wedding day concludes with Carl sitting forlorn and glum at the same altar on the day of Ellie's funeral. Yes, my beloveds, this is a children's movie, but it imparts an essential truth of life, which is also undergirded in this morning's passage of scripture which I will reread this time from the message version of the Bible, which translates the ancient text into contemporary language. While he lived on earth anticipating death, Jesus cried out in pain and wept in sorrow as he offered up priestly prayers to God. Because he honored God, God answered him. Though he was God's son, he learned trusting obedience by what he suffered, just as we do. Brothers and sisters, struggle is an inescapable aspect of life, not just for humanity individually and community and communally, but for the whole of creation. While what we struggle with may be unique to our specific circumstances, times, and places, and they may differ in intensity, we do not struggle in vain, for we do not struggle alone. Our faith in the faithfulness of God should fortify and strengthen our spirits as we struggle with the vicissitudes of life. The book of Hebrews presents several elemental truths about the life and ministry of Jesus, but the most fundamental emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. His humanity relates him fully to all humans. Let me repeat that. Jesus's humanity relates Jesus fully to all of us. This is a good word, my beloveds. Jesus moved through life knowing that his days were numbered. Just as we do, he knew that there, would, that there would be a time when he would no longer sit around a dinner table surrounded by friends and family telling stories. He knew that no matter how much wine there was, the day would come when the party would stop. He also knew that Mary and Martha would weep for him just as he did for their brother Lazarus. Yes, Jesus endured and remained faithful to his earthly mission of co-laboring with God to upend systems of marginalization that rob and, de and deny the divine in all that God has created. This leads us to another elemental truth about the life and ministry of Jesus presented in the book of Hebrews, which is that his was an exemplary model of a son and thus a means of hope for all. So many of Pixar and other family-oriented movies are chock full of pain and suffering that send the main characters careening into an abyss of sorrow, despair, and depression. If you ever watch any of these movies, you will be familiar with the emotions they elicit because at some point in our lives, they have entered our head, heart, and spirits, or we know that one day they will. How does one find hope amid despair? How do we remain hopeful when we know that sorrow is lurking around the corner? How do we summon strength and courage when our heads, hearts, and spirits are weak? My beloved, walk with me as we reread this morning's scripture, this time from the Cotton Patch Gospels, which recast the New Testament stories into the language and culture of the mid-20th century American South. 
during those days when Jesus was a man, he agonized in prayer, sometimes with pained outcries and tears, pouring out his heart to the one who could have saved him from such a death. And God listened to this kind of devotion, devout sincerity. Even though Jesus was a son, he learned his lesson the hard way. And when he had matured, he became an inspiring example of spiritual emancipation to those who come under his discipline. Now, by my beloveds, Clarence Jordan's version of the Bible portrays Jesus and his apostles and the early church as leaders of a revolutionary movement to dismantle the tyranny of first century Roman oppression. And it is a model for dismantling the tyranny of our own time. However, Jordan takes the action out of Nazareth, Gallery, Jer Jerusalem, and Rome and places it in Selma, Birmingham, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C. But it might as well be Ferguson or Minneapolis, Staten Island, or Sanford, Florida. In essence, the high priests, Sadducees, and Pharisees are Bull Connor, George Wallace, and Strom Thurmond, hell-bent on maintaining Jim and Jane Crow. Jesus is not crucified. In the Cotton Patch Gospels, he is strung up on it from a tree. That version of the New Testament makes it plain what it means to be a Christian, which is to partner with God and others to build the beloved community where righteousness, justice, and mercy reign. But it also speaks to the essence of what it means to follow Jesus. The book of Hebrews was written when some members of the early church were beginning to waver in their faith. Over the years, they had weathered persecutions that saw loved ones die and property taken away. They were outcasts and living on the margins of society because of their faith. Their heads, hearts, and spirits were weak. The author of the book of Hebrews reminds us to persevere in our faith despite our fears, despite our loss, despite our pain. The writer doesn't dismiss the pain. The writer acknowledges that the pain is real, just like the pain that Jesus endured throughout his life not just on Mount Calvary, but as he engaged in the teaching, preaching, and healing ministry among the people living on the margins of Roman-occupied Palestine. As I've said before, it wasn't a ministry solely focused on an afterlife where pain and suffering would be no more. No, it was also one that was meant to address the here and now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. While Jesus suffered here on earth because of his ministry and service, he endured because he honored God, the same God that is inside of all of us. When we think we are alone in our pain and our suffering, we are not. Ultimately, this is the lesson many of the characters in these movies realize. Mufasa's death is foreshadowed early in The Lion King when young Simba says, Dad, we're pals, right? And we'll always be together, right? In our heart of hearts, we know that Simba knows the honest answer. But just like him, we don't want to accept it. Let me tell you something. My father told me, Mufasa responds, look at the stars. The great kings of the past look down upon us from those stars. So when you feel alone, those kings will always be there to God. And so will I. Later in the movie, when Simba is wrestling with the evil of the pain, sorrow, and despair that has infected his inner being, he is visited by his father's ghost. You have forgotten who you are, and so have forgotten me, Mufasa Bellows. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. My beloveds, all people need to have agency to express who they are freely and to define the terms of their existence. This is the core of what it means to be human by allowing for the cultivation of healthy relationships. 
not only with oneself and with others, but also with the divine and everything created by the divine. However, marginalized people are often robbed of their agency by oppressive systems that emphasize power and profit over humanity and the dignity of the spirit of the divine within all of us. As a black father, I believe it is my divine call and service to love and nurture my sons with a strong sense of agency and with the knowledge of their place in this world. I view this as a radical act of resistance to the notion of white supremacy and systemic racism rooted in the foundation of this country and that persists today. I want them to dream and envision new realities that transcend the narrow confines of our current political, economic, and social institutions, while at the same time protecting them and, and, and inoculating them against the pernicious symptomatic and asymptomatic ills of racism. While I know that God called me to the ministry of Black fatherhood, it is daunting, often leaving me vulnerable. My beloveds, I cry, usually when I'm by myself, but sometimes when I look at my boys, them Palmer boys, and think about how others might see them. It hurts to know that I won't always be there physically to offer them a word of wisdom or sage advice when they encounter a hurdle that their knowledge and experience has left them confounded or cry or laugh or knock them upside the head, but y'all please don't report me, when they inevitably do something that will provoke the ancestors to say, not my baby, oh no, he didn't. But I pray that when those days come, I will have repotted the seed in them that was planted in me by Papa, Paul, Uncle Richie, Oko, Murphy Taylor, John Caldwell, Uncle Andy, Papa Johnny, Uncle Rick, and Pastor Hertzfield that will equip them for the knowns and unknowns of the road ahead. My favorite scene in the movie Black Panther is when T'Challa has, has become the Black Panther, but is unsure if he is capable of the task before him and conveys his doubt to his father while visiting him in the ancestral realm. His father responds, a man who has not prepared his children for his death has failed as a father. Let me repeat that. A man who has not prepared his children for his death has failed as a father. That too is a good word, my beloveds. This quote isn't about legacy in the vain glorious sense. It is about equipping future generations to manifest the purpose of creation, which is to co-labor with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to pick up the hammer of justice while raising our voices to speak truth to power. Life is not a sprint or a marathon, although it feels that way too often. But we must pace ourselves because life is a relay. The life and death of Jesus affords us access to God because it demonstrates what we do in this life is the pathway to salvation in the afterlife. If we only labor for ourselves and the moment, the movement dies with us. But Jesus knew that you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. This makes me think of Charles Hamilton Houston, born in 1895, one year before Plessy versus Ferguson, which established the legal doctrine of separate but equal, and thus Jim Crow. After serving in World War I, Houston committed himself to study the law to undo the legal framework of Jim Crow. His legal strategy culminated in Brown v. Board of Education, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1954, and it upended Jim Crow. But Charles Hamilton Houston died four years earlier. So my beloved, we endure the suffering of today for the promise of tomorrow. And I'm not talking about a tomorrow in the hereafter, but a tomorrow in the here and now. Even if it is a tomorrow that we may never see, but we know that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, those that 
we may never know, but will know us because of the seeds we planted in them and nourish them to their first fullest potential. What the gospel according to Pixar teaches is that yes, pain, sorrow, and suffering are real, that a, but that a faithfulness to the sacrifices that were made on our behalf can be the source of our salvation here and now and forever after. One of my favorite meditations by the great theologian and mystic Howard Thurman is called Life Goes On. I think about how life goes on as I pass the cemetery up the street from my house and see a funeral procession. I've been thinking about that often over the past year and a half, and I'm sure many of you have as well. While the COVID-19 pandemic has altered the way, our, uh, the way we live our lives, but life does go on. And it will once again, once this particular evil in our midst subsides. But Thurman reminds us that during turbulent times, we must remind ourselves that the wisdom of life transcends our wisdom and to attend to the little graces by which the dignity of our lives is maintained and sustained. But he, he reminds us that the evil, that evil is always present and that the real target of evil is not the destruction of the body, but the corruption of the spirit. So we must not let the evil in the world around us to move from without to within. Let me repeat that in case you didn't catch it. We must not let the evil in the world around us to move from without to within. My beloved, as hard as it might seem, we must not become overcome by evil, sorrow, and despair. Remember the presence of the divine already resides within us. So there is no room for evil because we practice a faith that sees the divine in ourselves and others. This too is a good word, my beloveds. So let us continue to honor our ancestors who looked to God in their weary years and to whom they cried with silent tears, the God who has brought us thus far on the way and by whose might is leading us into the light. Oh God, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Until we meet again, metropolitan family and friends, go in peace with the blessed assurance that the divine is always with you. Dione, thank you. Thank you uh, for listening to God and listening to my friend, Prince Rivers, uh, who has been a dear friend for almost 30 years, who connected us. I know it's not by happenstance that you came into my life and to our lives. I wanna thank you for the gospel according to Pixar, reminding us that we deal with death and struggle as we see in those films reminding us that the humanity of Jesus must be lifted up, that he was a son who learned lessons, much like we will and must, much like Simba, much like T'Challa, that Jesus embodied the spiritual liberation of the characters who move forth in their vocation, as must we. And then always the great kings, especially on Father's Day and queens, but today, especially the kings, are like the stars looking down upon us as Mufasa shared with his son. And I wanna say that not only was the sermon as wise as I considered that it would be, but it's a joy to see you embodying fatherhood and love and tenderness, even in the preaching moment. And so we thank you, sir, for your gifts and your leadership. God bless you and good to see you Caldwell. <laughs> see, look, you're teaching us, he is doing what he sees his father do. And this, Hi, all right, Hi. you take care of yourself, my friend. And so we thank you all for joining us on today. You have heard the gospel according to Pixar. Maybe you are looking for a church home. And if you are, your search is over. Welcome to the metropolitan community. We are committed to worship, to liberation, to service. And if you want to join with us, we extend to you an invitation to be a part of the movement that is us, the revolution of those who are deeply spiritual, connected to God through prayer, through meditation, through the spiritual disciplines, and then pouring over and pouring out our lives in the world. 
It's interesting, uh, yesterday working with Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, that the Hebrew scripture does not contain a word for individual. That word does not appear. That God does God's work communally. We are that community. Now, as individuals, we have calling, we have vocation, we have the disciplines that we're called to, but we are called to be the community that builds the beloved community. And so we thank you for being with us. And now receive this benediction. Go and love God by loving neighbor. Go and serve God by serving neighbor. And may God make you restless until you engage in the work of the revolution of the dawn of the new heaven and the new earth inaugurated by the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray and bless you all. Amen.